It's Marcia from Everything Wine and More. Uh, welcome to our virtual tasting series. I am excited today to have Andreas Bender here with me from uh, the Mosul in Germany. Uh, we're going to be talking, comparing some Rieslings here today, which will be very exciting. Um, thank you for joining us, Andreas, taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us here today. I first must say congratulations. I hear congratulations are in order. You are a father, so that's very exciting. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, is it was Julius? Is, am I correct? Julius. Julius. Yep. And when was, when was he born? Six weeks now, so still very, very small. Very tiny, yes. Waking you up at night, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, Anyways, how have things been going there? Very good so far. So, um, yeah, Williams are growing. We didn't have any frost this year. So the start, it's pretty slow. So it, it was a very cold ap April and also the beginning of May. It's uh, still pretty wet and rainy, which is for us perfect because we start into the season with uh, enough humidity, so hopefully we don't get the, the rain during harvest time. So, so far everything looks good. That's good. Well, you know, we had snow just the other day, so, you know, it can't be any... <laughs> I think it's maybe a little bit worse here. I mean, it's, we think it's cold. I mean, you, you, it's probably, you know, colder than it is there in, uh, in the Mosul. So, anyway. Um, so you have pretty much been in the, the wine industry your, your entire life. Uh, grew up in the vineyards. Um, so was it your your father and your grandfather that both managed vineyards, or how far back does your your line go? Um, the line goes very far back, um, but um, the family never owned no own winery. So my father was an um, employee in the nursery, so he was producing small wines and the plants, and he was specialist on on that uh, field. And the winery itself, I founded it 10 years ago now. Mm -hmm. So actually last year would be the 10 years anniversary. And um, yeah, so step by step, it's, it's still growing. It started as a kind of a garage winery. Mm -hmm. So at the beginning, uh, there was the idea of getting the best fruit from the best soils. So when I started the winery, it was started in two regions, with Pfalz and Mosul, and Mosul mm -hmm. especially for, for the Riesling. And that's, um, yeah, was always my dream to, to start an own winery, but there was not a rich family in the back who gave me a million just to open up a winery and buy some vineyards, buy some machines and everything you need. So um, at the beginning, I was looking for grape growers also to, to get the idea, getting the best fruit from the best soils, because not in every vintage, every hillside is in a perfect shape. So in a dry year, you need a heavy soil that keeps the water. In a wet season or in a wet year, you need, you need a lighter soil that leaves the water away. But the soil just has one, one character. You can't move your, your vineyards. So you have to, to get different spots in different hillsides. And we are focused on the steep hills here on the Mosul between um, Neumann Drohn, Drohn Hofberger, and uh, the Schweizer Annaberg. That's a distance about 35 kilometers, where we do around um, 22 hectares by ourselves. Beside that, we also get um, some fruit from some grape growers, which go down to um, the area of Bernkastel, Kracher Himmelreich, as well as uh, to the Saar, to the Offener Bockstein. So it's uh, like, a, like a piano. So I want to have the, the whole piano to play on and not just one single spot. That's important. Yeah. And have you had these grape growers the entire time you've, you've had your winery? Or yeah. have you just, like, they've just, sort of followed you? I just could start with, with these grape growers because um, if you don't have a rich family or much money in, in the back, it's tough talking to a bank uh, and asking them for money. So mm -hmm. these grape growers helped me at the beginning starting my, my own idea and, and project uh, starting the, the winery. Mm -hmm. So that's also why it's growing step by step from a kind of a garage winery now to a pretty serious winery the last 10 years. Yeah, excellent. So where are you right now? Is this, is this your, like your tasting room? Where are you sitting? 
Yep, that's our yeah. tasting room. We just finished it uh, right before Corona, so we just had one party in here. That's it. <laughs> oh, man. But uh, yeah, yeah. Hopefully. Well, hopefully soon. Yeah, you'll be able to to make great use of that space. It looks like a, a great space there. Um, so you know, um, you've been. <sighs> We've always heard that you've started, you know, you made your first bottle of wine when you were 13 years old. Um, I just, you know, I think that's just astounding. That is astounding to me that you are still making wine uh, now in your, in your 40s. And, um, you know, is, is it something, is it something that you, obviously that you always wanted to do or is it was just kind of expected of you? No, it's a kind of a passion. My father always opened an old bottle of wine, 59, 64, all these old vintages at birthday parties at Christmas. And that's how I got into drinking wine and drinking alcohol. And I wanted to continue the history of his library in, in our cellar. And so, um, yeah, I started doing just one wine each, each year in a pretty simple way, just uh, in a little bit sweeter style, but without any dry yeast enzymes, anything else. Mm -hmm. Like my grandfather or the, yeah, it used to be in, in earlier times here on the Mosul. And in that style, I did one wine and that's how we still do our wines until nowadays. So when I started the winery, I also wanted to do some wines that are perfect for aging. So I'm not looking on the real very young ones. I, we don't use any dry yeast, enzymes, everything you are learning at school, we are not usually not doing. So it's really traditional wine making, just brought together with a little bit more modern label and modern marketing. That's yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, you, you've, you've kind of been given a moniker called a maverick. You're a maverick of, uh, <laughs> of wine making and, and perhaps Riesling. And like, how do you, you know, do you, would you consider yourself this or do you kind of laugh at that? <laughs> Yeah, it's it's more the, the fun part, but um, yeah, I have got my own way and, and the own idea how our Riesling has to, to taste and how they should um, present in, in the class. So they're not the fruit driven in the first idea, the, the perfect fruit overload uh, wines. It's more the, the long distance wines. Mm. So we just opened... Um, 13 vintage, uh, the Paulison dry one, the 2011 vintage, which is um, for dry Riesling, almost 10 years. It's uh, yeah, pretty good, good time. And it's still very, very young and lasts another five to 10 years easily. Yeah, nice. Um, so you, you know, you work with uh, Pinot Blanc and Gewürztraminer and Pinot Noir and, you know, much to your chagrin, Pinot Gris. <laughs> And of course, Riesling. Would you say that Riesling is definitely your favorite grape to work with? Absolutely. Yeah. Riesling, Pinot Noir are the, personally to me, the most um, yeah interesting varieties. You get Riesling in a very light style, in a very heavy style. You get it young, you get it old. You get it dry, you get it sweet. So it's a, it's a portfolio you can make out of one variety that's enormous. So last vintage, we did almost 70 different wines. And I think most of it were, were just Riesling. Yeah. And you know what? It's it's so like, you know, Riesling is this grape that's loved by sommeliers all over the world and, and, and you know, by wine people. But it's so misunderstood. Like, I just feel like it's just so misunderstood because the moment that you say Riesling, the first thing that pops into people's head is, oh, it's sweet. Oh, it's sweet. It's sweet. You know, um, well, yes. However, there are these other styles of Riesling as well. So, um, you know... In some ways, you know, we're, we're kind of in this um, situation right now where we're having a hard time getting some wines over. So we wanted to definitely do your Pinot Noir and, you know, the Gewürztraminer, but we don't have any right now, unfortunately. But I think it's good that we're that we're talking about these two different um, Rieslings here. One is is dry and one is, you know, off dry. And it, it'll be good to make a comparison with these two here. So um I have to ask you though about um, about the Pinot wine, this blend of of Pinot Gris and uh, so Grau Burgunder and Weiss Burgunder that you make. And I know that you told me before that you do not like Pinot Gris. So why did you make why why did you make this wine? Was it just a market thing or? <laughs> no. 
I like I like Pinot Gris, but I don't <laughs> like the way it is presented uh, very in many in my, many wines. So um, Pinot Gris has got a um, um, tannins in in the skin. It's it's yeah. uh, coming from a red variety from Pinot Noir. So yeah. it's personally to me, it's not that light and and. Um, yeah, tasting like water wine, it's it's really intense and powerful, and that's also the reason why we put it into the oak, and give it some some more power and and yeah, yeah. what the variety looks like. Yeah, and you have to work with very low yields, and yeah, that's also very important to the variety. Yeah, I was just I was just curious about that, so thank you for that. Um, so what would you say the biggest difference is between Riesling from Mosul versus Riesling? from the faults or any other region of Germany? Um, the Mosul, we've got steep hills. We have mm -hmm. got the chalk. We have got a very special microclimate. And the Mosul is one of the northest and coldest um, Riesling growing area or wine growing areas we have. So it's um, just possible to, to grow wine here because of the valley and the Mosul River and mm -hmm. the slate. And the combination of these things makes um, yeah the the power of the of the riesling. Mm -hmm. So it's light, it's crispy, it's elegant, but it's never never boring. So it's it's very long in the finish, but very low in alcohol. So that's something um, nearly no other region can can do the same. It's, you need at least one percent of alcohol more in other regions to get the same aroma than the other also. Yeah, yeah. And the faults is mostly just where your Pinot Noir is? Yeah, Pinot Noir yeah. and uh, Gewürztraminer, more the reds and the international varieties. That's what okay. we do in the faults because it's much warmer, we've got heavier soils and different character to, to the Mosel. Yeah. So Mosel, it's more the, the elegant and more crispy, lighter style. Yeah. Okay, so let's let's get into the wines here. Um, so I, I was actually reading um, the the notes here, and um, I I realized that you don't do any um, fining at all uh, and light filtering. So therefore, that means these wines are good for vegans. Absolutely. Yes. So we have got just natural fermentation. So the grapes, as they come in from the vineyard, we bring them to the bottle. So they are just filtered ones and we try to keep them on the lease as long as possible to give them the the creaminess and, and the power yeah um we have these little stickers that we use in the store uh to indicate vegan wines because we have a lot of a lot of uh people asking for that so i'll make sure that these get the sticker because i was like huh i didn't really realize that so here we are so this this Paulison, so so give us your uh, your impression of this. What uh, what do we have here? We have the uh, twenty nineteen. The bone dry riesling, very intense in 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 the aroma, but uh, still balanced very nice by the acidity, not overpowered. So it's a perfect wine to to a lot of occasions. It's a blend of different vineyards along the Mosel, so it's like a puzzle where each wine or each hillside brings one certain character into that wine. So it's, it's pretty balanced and round and still very young. So another yeah. 10, 15 years. Yeah. Of aging yeah. And this is, uh, this is a gray, gray slate, Andreas, or what color of slate is this? Um, it's mainly blue and gray slate. Yes. Blue and gray. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. As opposed to the red, right. Which is another, um, that's color. a different different hillside. That's the Schweizer Annaberg. Okay. Yes, Annaberg. <laughs> so, of course, Riesling that laser sharp acidity um, that comes in the wine, and and I love this because of the you know this is a really good way to introduce people to a dry Riesling. I mean, you get like just a touch on the tip of your tongue at four grams per liter of residual sugar. That's sort of what we can perceive um, as as the sweetness on our tongue. So. Uh, if there's four grams per liter on this that the sheet says that there is, then there's just that, you know, just hint right when it hits your tongue. It's always a question of, of balance between the acidity, mm -hmm. sweetness, and, and the, the power of the wine. So with the next wine, 
there we can see it very easily with the balance but uh, the Paulison mm -hmm. that's more the the straight and yeah 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 and that's what I and that's the really important even um something as sweet as a um as a Bernoschlese or the, the Trockenbernoschlese you have that that balance you know you might have these really, really sweet, high residual sugar wines, but um, the acidity is also high enough to balance that sweetness, which makes it feel like it's not as sweet as it really is, right? Okay. Um, and the, um, okay, so oh, tell us about the name, Andreas Paulison. Where, where did Paulson, that come from? It's an old name from our family in our dialect. So Paulison, Dior, as both, both are um, names or words out of our Mosel-Franconian dialect. And Paulusen goes back to 1700 something, where our family had got a yeah, head uh, of the family named Paulus. And so the people in the village said, oh, that's a Paulusen house. It's kind of the name of the, the nickname of the, of the house. And Dayon means like it used to be like in earlier times. So right. like the wines were made in earlier times. So a little bit higher in residual sugar, but not sweet. Yeah. Okay. And this is also, this is the 2018 that we have. Um, and uh, if you notice, these are all both on uh, screw, screw cap. Um, so to, to retain that freshness um in the wines uh, but also uh, have the ability still to age so for the palace and um andreas you mentioned probably you know you, you opened a 2013 you said 2011 2013 okay and you, another 10 years you figure yeah easily yeah yeah so you know if you're looking at the 2019 then then you've got you know, another another 15, 20 years on this on this guy for sure. So um, that would be a great experiment to do with these wines because they're very reasonably priced. So for those of you that like Riesling and like to experiment with aging, these are great bottles to do it with because um, they're really very cost effective to do that. Um, the Polison is $20.99 on the shelf on sale right now um, until the end of next week for $18.89. It's a bargain. Okay, so now the Dior, I really get a lot more of that um, um, petrol, oh, sorry, this one, the, the uh, you know, that quintessential Riesling petrol. Um, are these, you know, how old are the vines that you use for, for this one? Um, most of our wines are 35, 40 years and older. Okay. So we still have got a lot of um, uncrafted wines that are around, 60 to, to 90 years old and the Dior also big part of that is aged on fermented in big oak barrels in the typical scuda mm -hmm. we call it it's 1000 liters and it's not toasted inside it's a neutral barrel it's a typical uh, for, for our area already mm -hmm. the, the Romans brought it here and, and used it a couple of hundred years ago so mm, almost two thousand yeah. years yeah so, so once these are open, Andreas, how, how long would they do you, do you think they would stay fresh for if I put it in my fridge? A week or two. See, that's amazing. That is amazing. <laughs> you don't, you don't, you still, you don't hear that, right? Even with a screw top wine, it's like you should still drink it within four to five days. But, you know, for your wines, you're saying a week or two in your fridge. Yeah. When they're young, like the 19 and 18, they will open up the first couple of days much more to, to show more what's what's behind. So it's kind of like the, the aging in the cellar just in a very yeah, fast way. So yeah. that's that's astounding. Uh, it helps. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. OK. So here we are in our. Um... Mm. So higher levels of residual sugar, 15 grams yep. per liter? 13 to 15 grams. Yeah. And always a question of, of the balance between acidity and sweetness. Because the yaw never should taste sweet. Mm -hmm. It's always just round, creamy, and, and fruity. Mm -hmm. mm. Lots of um, nice limes and lemons and 
Yes, I love the acidity because I'm having, my, my mouth is watering. <laughs> As I'm trying to speak, my mouth is watering. So you always know that that's a good clue uh, as to high acidity in um, in wine. And of course, uh, with Riesling, the um, the clue is always the uh, alcohol. So it's not much difference. The Paulison is at 12 and the um, Dior is 11.5. So very, very close as far as the alcohol. A little bit more sweetness, of course, in this Dior and, and um, here in this, um, well, during this time, right, with, with people ordering takeout and, and curbside pickup and, and that sort of thing that's, that's happening. Um, if you're ordering like anything spicy, spicy, spicy Asian cuisine or Thai food um, or, or sushi, you know, Riesling is a great, great match for that. So what would you, what would you have in Germany um, with with these wines, Andreas? Um, Asian food works very well, everything that's spicy, yeah. but um, when they're a little bit riper, when they are aged for a couple of years or even for, for two, year, two or three years helps, um, it sometimes works very well with, with some meat, mm. some some pork maybe, some, some barbecue also goes very, very well. Yeah, well, that's that's a good a good thing to know because not many people would think that uh, for a riesling that you could you could pair it with those foods, but that's very good to know. So, those of you that will be watching this video, um, take note because in Alberta we like to barbecue and we like our meat, so try a riesling it would be good. Yep. Um, so uh, you know we're you're famous, Andreas. Um, you know your your wines have been uh, on the table of of your German chancellor. Um, are they still being served in uh, in Lufthansa business class? Not at the moment, um, because no one is flying. Correct. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, yeah, we'll, we'll see afterwards what's what's going on, but yeah. it's not for the moment. So. Yeah. And what about Mr. Gordon Ramsay? Is he still using your wine in his restaurants? I, I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's pretty cool. U so. UK it's uh, also a pretty big market for us, and yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Any any other notable restaurants or any other? I mean, I know you. I know you're a humble guy, and you don't like to, you know, tell us these things. But come on, you know, where, where else? Who who else drinks your wine? That's you know, that's at these famous restaurants. Come on, don't be don't be shy. To be honest, I also oh, don't get it to to know all the time. So mostly afterwards, they they tell it to me. So yeah. Tough to say. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, and is um, is the UK your your biggest market for export? No, um, I think it's still Germany. It's very important, but also Alberta is it's very very important to us. And we don't have the the biggest market, so we try to spread it out. Yeah, all. In, in different countries yeah. and we don't want to have the, the big customers the real big ones we are more focused on the small people that are going to tell our story what's behind the wines mm -hmm. because we don't send any wines to journalists or wine writers okay. whether they buy it or they they come to the winery everyone can is welcome to to taste our wines but um we are not going to to send it to, to magazines to get the points and re reviews because people have to, to like our wines and have to drink our wines. And that's personally to me the most important mm -hmm. because the wine has to, to speak and not, not in, anything around. Yeah, well, that's that's for sure. And I mean, you're, you know, you're a bit of a one man show. So you're the guy that's coming into market and you're the one that's talking about your wines and and spreading spreading the news about your wine so so good for you um you know we we love your wines here in alberta and um i i do love telling your story and um uh it's it's just i'm just thankful that you make such good wine that it's easy to tell your story and it's easy to share it with other people so um hopefully you can come back again soon <laughs> i'd love to hopefully yeah, yeah, we would definitely love to see you soon when it's safe for everybody to travel. And, um, you know, all the best for uh, this upcoming harvest in um, in 2021. Hopefully you have no no big hiccups and no big fall frosts or anything like that. 
And um, yeah, it's been great to chat with you. Yeah, thank you. All right. And yeah, I hope you enjoyed the wines and hope to see you soon again in, in Alberta. Yes, for sure. Have a great evening and um, thanks, Andreas. <laughs>